Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Welcome back, Tan fans, to the continuation of our wonderful series on the spiritual masters. And uh, today we have two very special guests. First is St. Augustine of Hippo. He's our honor, honored guest today, and we're going to try our very best to get inspiration from his life and works through a number of episodes in this mini-series. Uh, but to help us do that, we have our other very special guest, my very close friend, Dr. Paul Thickpen. Thank you for being here, Paul. Connor, it's a delight, not just to be here with you, but with St. Augustine. He's one of my best friends. Yeah. We go way back now, Paul. I mean, we, um, let's see, we first uh, met a number of years ago and uh, stayed close in touch. And then you came and worked at TAN as our editor for a, a number of years. And, uh, and since then, and before then, and since then, you've been one of our best-selling authors, one of our most prolific authors. So let's talk just a little bit before we get to Augustine. Let's talk about you. So why don't you give our audience a little bit about your your educational background and your very prolific publishing career and what you're doing these days? Well, I guess I'll focus on the stuff that has to do actually with St. Augustine. There's because there's too much to cover, actually. You've done so much. <laughs> <laughs> He's true. That. But I... Uh, I'm twice a convert, I like to say, that I was uh, raised in a Presbyterian home, kind of nominal. Uh, at the age of 12, became an atheist, uh, six years. Uh, I was an atheist till my senior of high school, came back to Christian faith. Um, and then some years later, uh, decided to go to grad school to get a PhD, master's and PhD in historical theology. And so... Uh, What's I had, historical theology mean? It's, <clears throat> if you're just kind of straight theology, then you... You're kind of doing theological projects, you might say. Historical theology uh, focuses on the history of Christian doctrine, the development of, of Christian thought. And you can't do that for more than about five minutes before bumping into Augustine, I suspect. Well, as a matter of fact, my first semester at Emory University uh, had a, a wonderful professor, Dr. Mallard, with an entire course on Augustine. And that changed my life, really. He... Um, uh, I had to read. Someone has uh, once said that any man who says that he's read everything Augustine has written is a liar, and that's true. So we couldn't read everything. It's, I, it was his first biographer who was there with him at his death. And yeah, he said that in the very first five biography. and a half million words. Now we've that we have surviving more than Paul Thickpen, I think. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, let's just jump to it. You've you've published how many books now? Sixty. Sixty uh, yeah. books. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Anyway, but yeah, still not as still not five million. Still not five <laughs> million right, words. words. Not five That's million right. words. Yeah. That's right. So anyway, I uh, encountered Augustine as a, an evangelical Protestant, and um, and he was after that course. I was pastor in a church for a while, associate pastor for a while. But Augustine and others, when I began reading church history uh, and going back to the church fathers, everything began to change. I saw that uh, so many of the things I've been told about um, Catholic faith, that it was some something that came after Constantine or that kind of thing, that that wasn't the case. And you, you, you read these folks and you realize they were Catholic. And, and even beginning with a generation right after the apostles who received their faith from the apostles, like St. Ignatius of Antioch, mm. very clearly all the teaching on the Eucharist and on the bishops and other things. Chewed up in the mouth of the lions <laughs> like wheat. Is that uh, was that Ignatius of Antioch? I think yes. who famously said something like that. Yes. So, but with the Eucharist, he said it is the same body and blood that was on the cross. And oh. those who don't believe that, they've left us. Wow. And uh, wow. and he was he probably knew Saint Peter and Saint Andrew and some of the others in Antioch. So, but I began reading Augustine, and and he began to show me all kinds of things uh, that deepened the faith I already had, but also began to say, you know, knock on my door, <laughs> the door of my soul. There's a whole new realm out here. You need to start looking at Catholic teaching. And even practices. I remember the whole thing of praying to the saints. I'd never been hostile to that, but it just seemed like an alien thought. And I remember how I'm reading St. Augustine, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the Donatist heresy, but he's reading this 
I'm reading this essay against the Donuts of Saracia. And as I'm reading what he says about their sins against charity and against the unity of the church, um, I remember saying to myself at one point, yeah, Augusta, you're right. Get them. You tell them. That's right. And all of a sudden, I stopped and said, oh, my Lord, I am a Donatist. <laughs> <clears throat> because I had this notion of the church having to be pure. And we'll talk more about that later. Yeah. But, yeah. but things like that. And, and also, I remember one day thinking, I am talking to a saint. Because I really, I wasn't just kind of commenting on what I was reading. I would actually ask him questions and <laughs> say, is that what you meant? Like, and I stopped one day and said, I'm praying to a saint. Mm. And it feels so natural. So in so many ways, Augustine was uh, instrumental to my conversion yeah. to, to become Catholic then back in, wow, it'll be 30 years this year. <clears throat> well, in a sense, that's not unique, is it? It's <clears throat> happened so many times ever since Augustine. It happened in his in his life, which we'll get to, but his influence on people was immediate and persistent, and it's still happening today, especially when people read the confessions. And we're going to have mm -hmm. a an entire episode just on the confessions, but it's just it's the work that has had the biggest impact on people's personal lives. Well, for me. Again, yeah, talking about when I started reading that, and uh, and I've heard so many people say the same thing. I'm reading it. It's oh my goodness, this <clears throat> sounds like my life. I mean, his is so much better and deeper and more vivid in so many ways. But my life feels like a like a a faint echo of his life over mm -hmm. all these centuries. I, I know what he meant when he said that. It's it's so true uh, about me as well. And I'm not the only person. So many people have had that same experience. I'm. He's, he's telling my life with his words. All right, I, I have to say it because we were at dinner the other night <laughs> kind of talking about this. And you made a great analogy, and and it was and it was actually a, about a song that I have actually been listening to a lot recently, which I'll <laughs> fill in a minute. But you got to tell us. You got to tell us about the song. Well, when uh, in, it would have been the, the 60s, 60s, early yeah, 70s maybe, right. uh, where Roberta Flack recorded a song. I didn't know until you told me right. that it had been, it was a Sinatra. It was so, originally it Frank Sinatra, yeah. and that blew my mind, but it's the song uh, Killing Me Softly. Killing Me Softly. Killing right. Me Softly. Yeah. But the words, right? What was it? Uh, strumming my pain with, with his, his fingers. With his fingers, telling my life with his words. words. Killing me softly with his song. Yeah. Killing me softly. And <laughs> I thought about that. He's, he's telling my life with his words. It's like I'm, I'm listening to this song of Augustine. And it's my story. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, I love it. It's when you told me that we're talking about Saint Augustine. We're sitting at Starbucks, I think, and and you told me about that song. Kind of reminded you of your experience with the confessions. And I had just recently, you know, I, when I was in high school, I would think it was the Fugees who came out with kind of a a modern version of that, and we didn't know that. It came from the 60s, but the people listening to it in the 60s really didn't know that yes. it was Frank Sinatra who actually wrote this about um, a, a woman. So it's a, it's it's an awesome song anyway, and there's a million covers out there on YouTube, and I, I just love all of them. But it is fitting. It's, it's It was almost like providential. I've listened to that song probably 10 times mm -hmm. in the last couple of months, and then we're getting ready to do Augustine, and you make an analogy to it. So I got a kick out of that. But things like that happen all the time when you're dealing with God and the saints. So anyway. Providence. It's called yeah. providence. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about providence and how Augustine saw that work, you know, divine providence working throughout all of human history, particularly when we talk about the city of God. But on that note, let's kind of shift to uh, Augustine. You know, who was this man? I mean, uh, just a few introductory notes. He's a, uh, he, he was born in 354. And he's a doctor of the church. There's only 37 doctors of the church now. I think we're at 37 because Pope Francis has had a, a couple recently. He's also known as the doctor of grace. And so maybe we'll get to why that's the, the fact. And he's one of the most prolific saints of all time. We know that. And St. Jerome, who I'm a big fan of, said that August, Augustine established anew the ancient faith. Mm. Ancient faith. I mean, it was not that ancient at that time. You know, it's four, <laughs> we're talking 400 AD. But and but, it's especially interesting coming from Jerome because they ended up having tensions. The yeah, two of them. yeah, they had uh, some beef with each other, which I think is funny and I want, wonderful. Well, it's heard of a somewhere in Europe. There's a a church that has a big mural, you know, painting 
of Augustine and Jerome staying together, two doctors, fathers of the church, contemporaries, and they have the halos and they're looking so sweet. I remember thinking, no, they really ought to have them <laughs> with fisticuffs going. <laughs> <laughs> Duking it out a little bit. That's awesome. Well, let's start at his beginning, okay? So, yeah, he was born in 354, and why don't you kind of take us from there, and we'll talk about his life. Yeah, just in broad strokes, because it's uh, – interestingly enough, it's been said that we know more about this ancient man's life, personal life, than probably any other figure from the ancient world because mm -hmm. of his writing the Confessions. And mm -hmm. He told all these details, and then his biographer right after he died. Um, but 354, he's born in Tagaste, North Africa, which is in uh, the, the area that's now called Algeria. Algeria. Yeah. Um, some debate about his ethnicity. He, um, his father's name was Patricius, which is Roman, you know, Latin name. His mother's name was Monica, which was a Berber name. The Berber being the the native people of that that part of Africa. That very tip northern Africa, kind of yes. running along mm -hmm. the tip northern mm -hmm. Africa, going down towards the east where Carthage is. Right. Which was not very far. You take the Mediterranean Sea, I guess, across and you get to Europe. So it was kind of African, but heavily influenced by the Roman Empire. And that's, yeah, and that's why it's a little hard to know that it's not like his father, we you know, was Roman and his mother was was uh, native Berber. But rather, uh, it was such a highly Romanized part of the world. The Romans had taken over a long time before. Um, it was, North Africa was their breadbasket. Mm. And so highly cultivated Agri rich agricultural lands there. So it was important. But they retained the a certain African culture, and that's very oh, clear yeah. in, in, in Augustine's writings. Yeah. And, and so because of that, we his father could well have been Berber too, mm. uh, but just took on, you know, a Roman name. A Roman name. Because uh, he he was a, a town counselor, kind of like you might say. So the, the elites for sure would have been as Romanized as, as they could appear. And Patricius was a pagan, though. <laughs> And yeah, he was pagan, right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I read somewhere in preparing for this that he converted on his deathbed, but I had yes. never actually heard that before. So Yes, he did. Okay. And so um, so he kind of grew up in a home where there's a rather devout Christian mother and a pagan father. It's not all that unusual today, is it? <laughs> it's not. It's not. And he, he makes all kinds of interesting comments about Monica. It's, it's a classic story of, you know, mother and son and all the way into adulthood, the kind of, <clears throat> you know, interactions they have. And she was amazing because, uh, well, in so many ways, she she prayed him into the kingdom, you know, yeah. I'm convinced. Some patron of mothers, I believe, or oh, something. Oh, for sure. That, yeah. yeah. And of wayward, uh, of wayward children. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, uh, he comments once in his confessions that, um, that his mother, with regard to religion, his mother did everything she could to make God his father. And not Patricius. <laughs> mm. And um, well, when I screw up and my children see it, I'll tell them, "No, you know, you know I'm not your role model. God the Father's your role model." Okay, <laughs> so I kind of, I kind of use the same tactic. I try yeah. to point their eyes somewhere else. You know? Yeah. So, so he um, he grows up in that situation. They don't. Uh, they're probably, I guess, what we might call middle class. I didn't really use that term then, but he uh, not wealthy for sure. He has to have a patron to help him get an education. And he goes uh, to, to another, uh, an area not far away for, to begin his education and finally goes to Carthage for, to study rhetoric. And uh, the goal in mind of being a professor of rhetoric, but it was kind of a stepping stone to better things. Carthage at the time, you know, was uh, one of the most beautiful probably and impressive cities in that part of the empire. And so uh, according to, to his recall, it was also a cauldron of immorality. Mm. And so while he was there- his, Big city life. Yep, right. He's a little boy from a little town, you know, down this way. And he gets there and, and he talks about how he um, <clears throat> was just pulled into all that. And people have debated, scholars have debated how, how bad he really was that maybe he made it sound worse than it was compared to what it could have been. But in, in, any, in any case, from his own recollection, it's, it's, uh, he's pulled into just a, a whirlpool of, of immorality and other things. But he, he gets that studies there, and um, while he's there, his, his father dies, but as you said, does have a deathbed conversion. And the other thing that happens is uh, he takes a mistress. 
and well, we call it a mistress, but it's probably better to call it a common law wife. Yeah. And in those days, in Roman culture and law, uh, where he where he was, uh, you could not contract a, a normal marriage with someone who is not of your social class. She was apparently of a, of a, a lower social class, and um, there was still the relationship was still governed by law, um, so that she she had certain rights as a kind of a common law wife. And uh, not long after that, then they had a son together, a Deodatus. So um, those things happen in Carthage. And then also, while he's in Carthage, he, he becomes a, a manichae. Yeah. We're going to have a discussion later on about what is that heresy. But yeah, we'll just briefly touch on it because so, it's critical for his biography. Yeah. So it's uh, it was a, a religion that, I mean, some would say a branch of Christianity and it used Christian terms and some of the scriptures, but uh, basically heavily influenced by, by Eastern thought and um, was was quite contrary to, you know, to the rece- received tradition from the apostles. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but very influential, it, it ended up spreading all the way to China and all kinds of places. Um, as a great competitor for the Christian faith, they were very aggressive in their proselytizing. And uh, he was looking um, for a faith that would be very rational for him, that could explain everything, and that was their promise anyway. And so that's kind of, he got, you might say, roped into that. And they had, again, we'll go into it more, but it has elements of Gnosticism in it. And so you know, I could see a guy as intellectually curious mm-hmm. as, as Augustine, desperately seeking truth. I mean, clearly mm-hmm. he was seeking truth. Mm-hmm. And when somebody comes along and promises you this secret Gnostic knowledge, you're going to be intrigued. And yeah, I mean, the reason the Gnostic, all the different Gnostic religions are called Gnostic, it's from the Greek word gnosis for gnosis. knowledge. And it promises salvation through knowledge. Yeah. So that would be a very, very appealing to someone like that. It would be a lot easier, thing. actually, as long as you <laughs> have is. a decent IQ. Let's have a few, yeah, yeah, a few algorithms and this kind of thing. It would be saved. We'd have to bother with that moral conversion stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now he, so he's, uh, <laughs> So he's a well-trained rhetorician. He, uh, I'm not sure exactly where we are in that, but eventually he's trained in, in Carthage, but he, he moves to Rome and Milan at some point as a pretty well-recognized, proficient professor. Yeah, he's by that time he had taught back in his hometown, and then he had actually gone on to, Carth- back to Carthage to teach. And But he kept kind of moving up the... So he was, yeah. 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 And each time, as, as it is today, you, know, you have something to put on your resume, right? Yeah. Uh, so he he sails to Rome, and um, <laughs> he leaves Monica behind. And he wants another one of the comments he makes about her is, you know, yeah, all mothers really desire to be with their sons, but she really did. <laughs> <You know? laughs> she that's more than fun. those. That's fine. And <clears throat> she wants to go with him. He doesn't want her to go, and so he actually tricks her into leaving at a time when she wasn't expecting. And he goes on ahead, and she's just going crazy over it. But good old Monica. And her mother hen, mother hen, yeah, Monica. She goes anyway. I mean, she finds another, another ship to go, she and, and she goes and follows him. Wow! Right? Yeah. So, uh, is it is so, it where does he get Neoplatonism? Is that more in Rome or Milan, or is just kind of like an ongoing process where he starts really tapping into that? It's it's coming next. He uh, he gets it more in Milan. He becomes after he's in Rome. It's it's so funny. Some things never change. Everywhere he teaches. He has problems with his students, not yeah. because he's a bad teacher, but because either they're rowdy and not paying attention. That was the problem in Carthage. In Rome, they wouldn't pay their they pay the bill. So yeah. he taught the whole semester, <laughs> right? And, and they pay their bill at the, at the end, end, and they just disappear. And they would just run away. Yeah, wouldn't go to the final <laughs> class. <laughs> so I was like, that sounds about right. Gosh. I've been a professor before. Maybe uh, that's why today's colleges make you pay. Yeah, when up, front. Be up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what happens? He he. Um, from Rome, then he becomes a professor of rhetoric in Milan, and a lot of us wouldn't maybe not realize today that at that point the emperor was actually living in Milan. Really, so it I was the yeah. kind of surrogate Roman capital, you know, mm. rather than Rome. He's still a, a manichae, but he meets Saint Ambrose, Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, and um, Ambrose's preaching just intrigues him because he's a rhetorician. He he wants to. He hears that Ambrose is a great preacher, and he wants to see what he can learn from him in that regard. So he doesn't go, first of all, probably because he's interested 
in Catholic teaching, he's going to hear how a, how a good preacher does it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And he goes and he starts hearing the stuff that's making the difference uh, in, in his thinking. And uh, also, just a one note is uh, Ambrose was really the last. Uh, Western father who really understood Greek and had read the Greek resources. Mm -hmm. Augustine never mastered Greek. And the others after him, I mean, all the way up to the Middle Ages, they, they didn't do Greek. Mm -hmm. So Ambrose did kind of have a unique kind of twist on him because he had read these great Greek texts and the Latin text. He's, he was totally proficient in both. Kind of ended after him. And yeah. I, I bet you yeah. that it just made him a little different and a little bit more compelling for a curious mind like Augustine. There are times until Augustine will drop a comment that makes you think like he still feels like he's a little inferior, maybe because he did learn the Greek yeah. the way yeah. everybody wanted yeah. him to, and he should have. He should have paid more attention to it when he was learning it. He said, "I think he, I so, think there was a Greek professor when he was young that was real hard on him. And yeah, oh yeah, beat him up and, and flog so, them. He would flog them. And that kind so of thing. I mean, Augustine, being the strong-willed <laughs> child that he was, he just said, "I refused to learn Greek." Then. <laughs> you know, so with that that going on, that would have made him kind of admire and even envy maybe Ambrose yeah. some too yeah. as well. He's got all that going on. So, But Ambrose, you know, I think Augustine in the confession says that Ambrose took him in like a father, you know, or like a son. I mean, he just, he treated him. He wasn't just a bishop. He was, he played a mm -hmm. fatherly role mm -hmm. to him. So they really formed a, sounds like a close relationship, which is amazing. Whenever you have a saint mentoring mm -hmm. a saint, that's kind of amazing. Here yeah. we have a doctor yeah. of the church mentoring a doctor of yeah. the church. I <laughs> yeah. mean, goodness gracious. And then you've got the Monica thing going on. And, yeah. and I'm not putting her down. She's a wonderful saint. We we prayed to her many times for our family. Um, but we have this great episode in, in the Confessions where he says that she um, she went to Ambrose and she was just crying and saying, oh, my son, he's in the Medicaid. He's got all this stuff going on. I want you to talk to him. I want you to have this happen before. Yeah, I want you to talk to him. I'm sure you can talk about it. This and uh, and Ambrose just kind of – he doesn't brush her off, but he's saying, uh, he's going to have to want it. Oh, I can't just talk about it. He's going to have to want it. And she presses and presses. And finally, I mean, Augustine says she's, he's kind of wearied of her. <laughs> he says, look, the, the, the son of a mother of so many tears surely will not lose his way or will, not, you know, will be saved or however he put it. And she just straightens up and says, Oh, thanks. <laughs> she goes, because as Augustine says, she took it as, as a prophetic word prophetic from God. Word, yeah. Yeah. And, if, and it was. <laughs> but I also heard, read somewhere that Ambrose, it's funny, I, I just can't remember one-tenth of you know where I got information, but I read somewhere that, that Ambrose told her, if if you would pray for your son more than you complain about him, yes. he, uh, he would be more likely to convert. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> that, yeah. That's a great one for and us just, parents. I to know. Remember. I know. And he took it. She took it to heart. So it's uh, it's wonderful. So what's happening then is while he's there, he's moving away from the Manichees, and part of that is under the the influence of, of Platonism. Um, he's he begins to understand. Well, we, we'll go more into that with the Manichees, but they they posit this God of of pure evil along with the God of good. Dualistic. And he, yes. And he comes to say, you know, my understanding of, of good is, is that it's real and evil is, is a privation of good. It's a lack of good. It's a deficit of good. And to exist is good and to be intelligence is good and to love, have a will, all those things are good. If you take everything away that's good and make it pure evil, it ceases to exist. Mm. And that and, and other things, he began to, to realize that the Manichees were not, for his, in his case, uh, fulfilling the promise to give him this great, highly rational belief system for the world. So he's moving away from them and um, becoming something of a skeptic. But uh, he's also beginning to read uh, more of the Platonist work. So in particular, Plotinus. Plotinus. Platonus, I enjoy Plotinus. And Porphyry. Yeah. yeah I yeah. really enjoyed them. You know, I mean, I'm a kind of consider myself more of a Platonist kind of skeptic quasi philosopher than, than Arist Aristotelian and I've taught Plotinus and I can I'm intrigued I see the way he talks about certain things and I can see how Augustine over time sort of plucking things out of that to help explain the Trinity and all all kinds of things so I'm I'm very sympathetic to the Neoplatonists of the day and, and it was a bridge of sorts in that, uh, ironically the, the the larger Gnostic tradition and some of the, the Manichees actually themselves have drawn from that tradition some. I don't know that they were, were obvious about it, but if you read their works, I had a whole course 
at Yale on Gnosticism. Yeah. That's, they were reading a lot of that stuff too. Yeah. So for him, it, the ideas would have, he would have already been introduced to some of them, but he found the Manichees, they, they just weren't satisfying intellectually. Yeah. So he begins reading those things. And as he says later, he, he does find all these wonderful insights that they had a sense of the word of God, the logos of God, the reason of God. But what they didn't have was that the logos became flesh and dwelt yeah. among us. Yeah. Or personal. I think that's the thing mm -hmm. is like mm -hmm. lo logic for me gets that there's a God, but it doesn't get that he's a personable God. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's just the difference. And you in know? fact, yeah, a lot of it with Eastern roots tends to make God an impersonal force. I was like, you know, the force in Star Wars. Yeah, kind of yeah thing. I mean, that's yeah. the one, you know, Platonus with the one. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. there's a lot of truth in how he says that this ultimate unity, you know, um, but it's totally far removed from us. For Plotinus and those guys, it was impossible for something so perfect, so one to like um, degrade itself by interacting mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And so the demiurge, the, that's the entity that ends up creating the mm -hmm. world, is begotten, not made, consubstantial with the one. And we have some of that language in our yeah. creed, don't we? So, yeah. I mean, there, there, there really are these little connections. And Augustine was masterful at kind of baptizing some of these, you know, pre-Christian or, you know, pagan or philosophical things. And he was not above bringing that into the mm -hmm. faith to using it. And it was masterful. It was, I think it was just masterful. Sorry to interrupt. But, oh, you know, no, no, that's good. So that, that, that's going on and, and his, his mind is being converted in certain ways into a more Neoplatonist form. Uh, but then there's Ambrose and there's the Christian preaching. And he gives a, he gives a look at Christian scripture to try to, you know, see what I can find here. And, He's it kind of leaves him cold, probably mostly the Old Testament, especially that it he doesn't find intellectually satisfying. There's got to be something going on here that I don't get. And um, and Ambrose's preaching helped him to see uh, kind of how you look at that material mm -hmm. and that you you draw analogy from it. That's that's something that's been going on in you know Christian interpretation for a while. And um, I think it was I think it was Origen. <laughs> who was the first oh, one sure. to bring mm -hmm. the allegorical meaning of scripture and people were really struggling. That was very early on, but I think origin had a significant impact. So, I mean, all of this was just what, what, what amazes me, Paul is we're, we're in 400, you know, late three hundreds and all of this was so new. I mean, it was just a couple hundred years old because the first 150 years of the church or whatever, there's, you know, things were written, but it was just little pamphlets. It was all oral tradition and it was only the last, 100, 200 years when Augustine's there that there's more scripture to read, the canon's being organized. And here he goes, you know, learning to to read scripture. And later on, we're going to talk about on Christian doctrine, which is really his masterpiece on how to read scripture. But I'm, I'm amazed at how this academic philosophy driven rhetorician <laughs> takes all of those skills and really masters and teaches us how to read Holy Scripture. Mm -hmm. And that kind of began with Ambrose. I just find that to be a fascinating thing. And I can see how with his knowledge of Virgil and Cicero, when he sat down to read the Old Testament for the first time, he must have been like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. What yeah. is this? And so he had to have a conversion to understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, I find that fascinating. And the interesting thing is once he gets, you know, fully into the Gallic faith and you, through his preaching, as we'll, we'll be looking at some of his homilies, his sermons, that his his native African tradition begins to come out because that that stuff, you know, wasn't kind of part of the native culture. It uh, was being introduced by folks who were being influenced by Roman and Greek uh, culture, but um, the the... The African, North African way of looking at things and, and talking about things was much more concrete, much more vivid, uh, much more narrative, um, and and it was witty, it was colorful, and so I can imagine too that that might have pressed on him in certain ways because he he obviously was that way himself that he would read all that stuff and he'd appreciate the Neoplatonist works, but it probably still was lacking for him. It's not concrete and. And once he begins to hear from Ambrose and others, he says, oh, now I get it. You know, mm. that's why these texts. Yeah. 
concrete. That's why they're vivid. That's why they tell stories, all those things. You still have to put it with the, the deeper theology and, and what it represents. But that convergence, he yeah. already had within himself the, the Berber culture and, and the Roman culture, the classical culture. So that brings us up to his conversion. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. so what, how does that, how does that come about? He's hearing Ambrose, he's talking to Ambrose, and then kind of what's the next step in that conversion? Well, he's, uh, he's in, a, in a home that, uh, with some friends, and they have some guests. Um, don't remember all the details, but they end up talking about the lives of the, the monks of the desert and, and how it, they've given up everything. They're celibate, they, they eat almost nothing, <laughs> and they've given up their lives for the kingdom. In particular... Yeah. The life of Saint Anthony yes. of the Desert, which yes. we publish. I was looking around to see we do we have it yeah. laying around here, but it's one of my favorite works. I just oh, taught yeah. it. I just taught it to the. We teach this high school class on Fridays, and just taught that. But boy, Saint that Athanasius had written it right. Yeah, it yeah. What a great story! I can see this. I can see this hitting a guy who's been living the big city life mm-hmm. for a while now. Mm-hmm. He's kind of moved up in the world and. He's probably got a nice little concubine, and he's got a nice job, and then he reads about this crazy story of this monk battling the devil in the desert for like 50 years, <laughs> 60 years. And you know that had to rock him. He's like, if if a third of this is true, this this changes everything. So I, I can imagine that this just totally rocked his world. And I should mention, by him, by now he had given up his, his common law walk. Well, Come along, wife. Yeah, and because and that was because Monica wanted him to have a, a regulation Roman marriage, you know, full marriage. Well, and I think and, that I, I want to read a little a little passage um, from the confessions here because we can all be sympathetic to this concubine, this yeah, woman, yeah, you know, and yeah. and it was it was not as foreign to them as it is to us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, I want to read this. So Augustine wrote after he's talking about how Monica set him up for like an arranged marriage. And he couldn't marry that the young woman yet because she was too young, so she, he had to wait for her to become of age. So for, he for the arranged marriage for right. the arranged mm-hmm. marriage. Mm-hmm. But he said this in his in very Augustinian way, I guess. My mistress being torn from my side as an impediment to my marriage, my heart which clave to her was racked and wounded and bleeding. You know, I mean, so this hurt him. Yeah. This was not just some meaningless woman to him. This tore him apart. And then he confesses that, you know, he was still a man of the flesh and was, you know, used to having this woman in his life. And so he calls himself a slave of lust. And so he procured another concubine as he had to wait two more years for his mm-hmm. The, the young and uh, fiance, I guess, to to be of age. Um, but he says his emotional wound was not healed. And this is when St. Augustine, when he had these, these other ladies, this is when he famously said to the Lord, uh, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. Not yet. Wow. <laughs> not yet. I just had to share that because yeah. it really yeah. shows he was struggling. He was struggling. He loved this woman. She left. But he hadn't detached from all those sexual desires yet. And they had a son together. They, they had loved a son. Deeply. Yeah. So he, this, he was, yeah. Anyway, I just find that kind of a, a beautiful story in a way. A mm-hmm. sad, tragic story, but mm-hmm. beautiful at the same time. Mm-hmm. Sorry, but that's a... That's, that's a, good. And, that's and good. so we get back to, uh, he's reading Anthony in the Desert. The, the, the concubine's gone, and his conversion kind of starts to begin. So they're talking about that life, and he... I guess you could say in modern terms begins to come under conviction that, you know, what am I doing? These guys are taking the kingdom by storm. And uh, The guy's out in the desert. Yeah, the yeah. guy's out in the desert. Yeah. And he begins to have this inner struggle, and um, he begins to weep, and he's kind of embarrassed by that and makes, makes his friend uncomfortable that he's with. So he has to leave the house and go out. Side and he's into weeping. this garden. It's a famous kind yes. of garden. Yeah, you know. and under a fig tree. Under a fig tree, which is, is just so biblical. I know, you know? It is. It's just... <laughs> and while he's there and got to pour his heart out that way, he hears the sound of a child. He said, didn't know if it was a boy or a girl, but you know, because little child is going to have a high voice, uh, saying in Latin, Tolelege, Tolelege, take up and read, take up and read. And somehow it seems to him that this is God talking to him. 
not not that God was the child, but but through this, God was talking to him. And he wasn't even, I don't think he even knew of any game that would have had those words had those that words. they would be playing, but it sounded like these children saying that. So we went back in and they had a, a scroll of scripture and he opened it up. <clears throat> and the first place he looked at, it was uh, Romans 13, 13 to 14. And uh, I can't, don't have all those words memorized, but it's basically St. Paul saying, stop living in lewdness and licentiousness and all those other things and put on Christ and his holiness. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh my goodness, this is God speaking directly to me through this. This is his word and he's speaking to me. And so that becomes kind of a, a moral conversion for him. The, the intellectual conversion had already been going on, but a, but a kind of moral conversion. So then he enters a long process of RCIA and has to show up at the church every Wednesday. No, it's <laughs> Ambrose. Continues. But it is it isn't exactly right. I mean, he doesn't go right away. I think it's into the next year. Yeah, it takes a while. But it is it's, it was the ancient version of RCIA, yeah, right? Yeah. And Ambrose eventually baptizes him. So he has to go back to Milan for that, and uh, he's baptized by Ambrose, and then um, they're going to be returning to Africa. And they're at Ostia, which is was basically the port that served Rome. And um, they're waiting, and they get delayed. I this is after he's converted, though. Yes, he, right. Okay, he's been, he's baptized been baptized now, okay. and now they're they're all preparing to to go back to to Rome. This would have been three eighty seven, I guess. And <clears throat> while he's they're waiting to return, he and Monica have this vision, you could call an ecstasy, um, a mystical experience. He, he talks about it. It's a little hard to know for sure whether they're seeing things externally or internally, but it's as if they're caught up to heaven together. Mm, wow. And uh, a, a beautiful thing. So there's a, he has his, had his mystical side as well. And then after that, uh, she falls ill, and she realizes that she's going to die. And uh, among other things, what, what's so powerful to me in that story is that he reports that all through her life, she had made it really clear she wanted to be buried back in Africa next to her husband when she died. And it seemed to be a, some concern to her that that had to happen. So here they are. Well, they were very, the, the, as, uh, the Africans were very attached to the land. They mm -hmm. had this real mm -hmm. sense of homeland that may be more of a Mediterranean type of, you know, European sense that didn't have. Or the American South, you know, it's, uh, I've always seen that as a part of traditional Southern culture. You're very tied to the land. Yeah, I mean, if you told me I was gonna be buried up you know, somewhere up in north, I'd be like, "What <laughs> yeah, are you talking about? Right, yeah. <laughs> I already got my <laughs> my, right. my my spot picked out." You know, but the amazing thing was that she said when they they brought that up, and she said, "No, it's okay. Bury me here on Resurrection." I'm paraphrasing, but on Resurrection Day, the Lord will know where to find wow. me. Wow, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, that's what the perspective I should have. Exactly. But I'm still sitting yeah. there saying, <laughs> "Yeah, no, well, no, still, no, yeah, no, no, bury me here." <laughs> so, so she she does die. There. But then they're they're finally able to to make it back to Africa, and uh, with the Adatus and the son, um, he has retreats at Tagaste, and the son dies. He had a bad year. Yeah, Augustine. It's a, this would have been maybe a couple of years later when his son died. But at 15, um, he was about 15, 16 years old when he died, I think. Yeah, somewhere the son. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tragic. So, um, but he's you know he's baptized. He's he's had reputation as a teacher. And so uh, word gets around, and there's a, a, a bishop who, at Hippo who needs uh, anyway, assist a bishop, and uh, the people's like, grab Augustine. <laughs> and he says he's very reluctant. They basically press him into, into being ordained. Mm -hmm. and of course, it was, God, it was God's will, and it's obvious you know, now. But so he was kind of like a, a assistant adjutant bishop for a while and then full bishop because the, the other bishop was dying. So uh, he's ordained priest there. Uh, it doesn't happen right away. He doesn't become bishop of uh, till 396. So there's a three or four year gap, I yeah. think. Is that what it was? Yeah. yeah. But one interesting note is that as soon as he's, as soon as he's ordained a priest, he starts preaching, which was not common mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. I think it was mostly the bishops did all the mm -hmm. preaching, but his mastery of of rhetoric, uh, rhetoric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people wanted to hear him right away. Yeah. So, and the good thing is he he already begins to get then all kinds of training as a pastor. Right? Every every pastor you know, if you ask him, that's 
you can learn all you want in seminary, but you just got to do it. You got to learn by doing it. And so he begins to be trained for the great pastoral work he had. Yeah. So he's a bishop in 395. And, or, yeah, a bishop and then the bishop in the 396. Bishop, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, 300. Okay. Yeah. And the next year, Ambrose dies, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. God, he had a, yeah, he had a tough couple of years. Yeah. One of the interesting things that as soon as he was made a bishop, I find this just fascinating and it kind of shapes, puts in context the rest of his life with all of his relationships. Bishops usually lived alone, kind of a little bit of a mm-hmm. life of luxury. Mm-hmm. And he created a different environment from the very get-go. Tell us about he that. Did. Well, he still, you know, he, he had been convicted by the monastic way of life. When, and that encounter that he had, I mean, it's just a one view into a, a larger process. And, um, and so, yeah, he did develop a model of having multiple priests live together with the bishop and uh, kind of care for each other, support each other, strengthen each other. It's a, it's a model I wish we could have today. All, you know, it yeah. happens occasionally. The oratorians do that, for yeah. instance, not with the bishop, but together. But um, I've known so many priests who live maybe in rural areas or something. They're alone. They're so scattered, they're yeah. alone. It's uh, it's very difficult. They need, need some support. One anecdote um, from this great biography I read of his by Peter Brown, the one you recommended, is uh, in his bishop's house at his big dining room table because he had a lot of priests living with him. He etched into the wood... I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's basically if you use your mouth to gossip at this table, you cannot use your mouth to eat at this table. <laughs> I love it. I forgot and it was so, <laughs> That's great. And so, because, um, you know, priests probably get together and start talking about all the crazy people they had to minister to during the day, you know? <laughs> yes. And, and um, so, but he insisted that these priests live a pretty rigorous life. They embrace poverty. He said later in his life that uh, if you were, um, if you wanted it, it, you you had to give all you had away and give it to the poor, or else you would not be a priest under his mm. under his authority. And in fact, there was a scandal um, later in his life where a priest who had been that he had ordained and brought into his inner circle, they found out he had not sold everything, he had not given everything mm. away. Kind of like that scene in the Acts of the Apostles. Mm-hmm. But these, I don't think this guy dropped down dead, you know, <laughs> yeah. at the feet of Saint Peter, yeah. like they did in the Acts, but. Um, you know, but he was really angry, and it was just because he believed that the priest should should really live kind of this radical life of Christ. He didn't have to go out into the desert like Anthony of the desert, but if you wanted to be a priest in his diocese or whatever you called it back then, you had to be poor. You had to be simple. You had to you had to be very careful in how you spoke about people. Um, it was he lived as a vegetarian. I mean, he was he was pretty he was yeah. pretty stern because meat was a luxury, not for animal rights, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. But it was <laughs> yeah. he was a it was luxury. He avoided all luxuries, and he was he, so we yeah. t- we tend to forget that because he's such an intellect. But yeah, he was in yeah. a sense an ascetic at the oh, same yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, the amazing thing is, by the force of his personality, you know, he still attracted all these men to that into that life, and it became like a. A nursery of bishops, if you want to call it that. So many bishops that went out to North Africa had lived with him at some yeah. point in that setting. And so imagine the influence that he was having through these men that he had basically personally discipled them. It's like a kingmaker, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that kind of leads us up. Um what next? You want to kind of move to the end, like kind of his his death, you know, his or his old age. Well, just to, you know, we'll be talking more about some of his works, but just around the year 400 is when he is writing his confessions. There are controversies that come up, the Donatist controversy we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, By the way, when he wrote those confessions, he was 43. That's my age. It made me, (laughs) when I realized that, I'm like, (laughs) wait, I'm way behind here. (laughs) Man, this is crazy. Goodness. Then we'll just mention briefly again, we'll talk more about it with City of God, but 410, the sack of Rome uh, by the Visigoths under... Allery. And that prompts then eventually the writing of the City of God. Uh, he writes on the Trinity, some other things. The Pelagian controversy we'll talk about comes at this. So all this is kind of happening during his, his uh, episcopacy. And um, Jerome dies. And 429, the, the Vandals invade North Africa. And they start their way slowly over you know, Carthage in that area. And the Vandals are Arian. 
Yes, they are. They are Aryan and they do what? They vandalize everything. <laughs> That's where we, That's get, where that. we get the word. That's People right. don't realize you vandalize yes. something. It's from the vandals because when they came through, they sacked, they pillaged, they raped, and they took what they want. They vandalized. And, and they that's especially where we get the, the Catholics. Yeah. Because they, were, they were Aryans. And, yeah. They were still I mean, Aryans. Ambrose, you know, at Milan, with a, we had, a, had an Aryan uh, emperor who demanded that they turn the cathedral over to the Arians. So yeah, the I think Catholics Ambrose did. was ready to be a martyr. He thought he was going to be oh, martyred. Oh, he called the people together and they got into the cathedral and said, you know, take it from us. Wow. <laughs> pretty amazing, pretty amazing thing. It is amazing. And so <laughs> there was there was a time towards the end here when the Vandals came through Hippo. I think Augustine's an old man. He thought he was going to be martyred too. Of course, yeah. They yeah. were ready. So, And they, that's when he actually starts, is, he starts writing at that time, Paul, about – perseverance like he's mm-hmm. he starts writing a lot then about uh will god provide the grace to persevere and he preaches on that it's a lot mm-hmm. of sermons but it's at that time because they know it's coming they know the rome well, they is fallen. Had a siege. that's i mean they've gotten to the city gates and they're out there yeah and then they're beginning to go hungry because they can't get to the food so it's not just oh we hear they're coming but they're at the gates they're there the barbarians wow. are at the gates and um and he's ill Interestingly enough, one of the few miracles attributed to to Augustine was during that time that it was the healing of a sick man, and it took place during the siege, right before yeah. he, he died. I heard that he joked when somebody came and asked for his healing. He said, well, I, if, I, if I had the gift of healing, I'd heal myself. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, he's so funny. But then in 430, he dies at Hippo on August 28th. Yeah, but let's say how uh, is a beautiful a beautiful thing where he I'm going to do this one day if I if I know I'm dying I'm going to do this he he taped up on the wall mm. all around his room the the penitential psalms of David which I'm not sure which ones are the penitential psalms but he taped them up so he could just read and weep read and weep and he turned away all the guests and he just wanted to read and weep until the end isn't that amazing yeah. isn't that a great way to go. <laughs> I got. That's what I got to do. I got to get the sign on. If know. we if we get the grace of knowing, yeah, if no knowing that we go, I know. I'm saying, it, but that's a great way to go. Yeah. God, and it's so yeah. it's so him. It's just perfect. It's just like a perfect ending yeah. to a you know an, a remarkable life. And his friend Placidius, he'd known him for forty years, and they've been close. He's present at that time, and and after his death, he's he writes the first biography yeah. of Augustine. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful. So that kind of, you know, that's that's his life. And we're going to cover more of it in uh, when we go into our next discussion on the confessions. And we'll try yeah. not to repeat, you know, everything. We'll talk yeah. more we of the spiritual side of, yeah. of confessions. Yeah. And we haven't talked about the pair. There's certain things we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> right. We'll get to some other things. But just would, in closing, yeah, what no, we, I was going to say any last, any last thoughts yeah, on his life? Yeah, just that you know, he dies in 430. 431 was the Council of Ephesus, the third ecumenical council convened oh, that year. Oh, really? How different might things have been? I mean, not the outcome of the, what they taught, but what would it have been like if Augustine could have attended hmm. the Council of Ephesus? Well, but it was not, not in the plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure his teachings influenced the people who were I'm there. Sure, yeah. Well, it's uh, any last thoughts on his life? I mean, um, just in, in, in closing, um, before we get to going more into his works, what do you have to say about this remarkable life, relatively long life? He lived into the seventies, whatever that math is. You know, he was he was yeah. an old man. He never wasted time. What do you have to yeah. say about just his life and what it means to you? Well, I could go on for hours, but I, you know, I love the quote at the beginning of the Confessions in the, the first page: "Our hearts are." You know, made for you, O Lord. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And I see him as a restless man all of his life mm. because he's searching for truth, which he understands ultimately means he's searching for God and looking for him everywhere. And, and all these different things he did and, and all the things he wrote, it was a search. It was He was on a, a hunt all of his yeah. life. And uh, that's one thing we can learn from him, to never give up seeking out God by seeking out the truth. Yeah, it's a perfect way to close. I had forgotten about that obvious quote, which we would have gotten to at some point in this mini series. But our hearts are restless until <laughs> they rest in you alone, O oh Lord. That does summarize this man's 
life completely. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. actually – that's how we should open up the next episode when we talk about the confessions when we come back. And that is that is the one sentence that summarizes the whole book and yeah. put it up there in front. So, well, God bless you, Paul. Thanks for this. It's so wonderful. And St. Augustine, pray for us. Thank you, Connor. What a joy. What a pleasure. All right. Bless you too. See you next time. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to get special offers exclusive to Spiritual Masters listeners, sign up at spiritualmasterspodcast.com. And thanks for listening.